First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Aubrey for inviting me again. So I spoke at the SAN 3 conference uh, last year. And also, unfortunately, it caused a lot of trouble because there's so much noise. But also, uh, I think uh, this project also attracted a lot of the public attention. And uh, in the recent days, I have to deal with a lot of the media interview. Uh, tomorrow morning, you may read something in the newspaper. But I believe there's some site that has already posted their report uh, for this talk. So the main purpose for today's talk is um, trying to announce the opening of this uh, clinical trial. And uh, we have already have a website live today um, as we talk. And uh, this is the beginning. So perhaps you can go to the website and look at some details if you haven't got the chance to get everything in the next 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, but remember, this is not www. It's got one behind it. Uh, I, I want to start because after last year conference in Cambridge, I was invited by the Chinese government to give a talk uh, during Christmas. So I give a talk on the Christmas day. But the very next day, that I realized it was a very close call for me. Because you realize this, uh, if you don't read Chinese, you probably don't know what's happening. This is a public execution of a, a criminal, violent criminal. <laughs> so I thought I was that close to get myself <laughs> into a lot of trouble. <laughs> but but it's also a give you the similar sentiment that is um, a very controversial uh, project in terms of basic science approach to things. So, but we believe that we are based on observations. Uh, some people call, call us uh, phenomenologists, and we we'll probably accept that uh, name. The main concept for this, um, uh, this project is very, very simple, because um, this idea that we may have natural re resistance to cancer present in our body at all time is not a new idea. It has been proposed for <laughs> over 100 years. And in other words, we're sitting here cancer-free is not because we're lucky. It's because we may have an innate system in our body to protect us. In other words, to get rid of cancer cells at all the time. If we get older, and this may get weaker, and that balance between the generation of cancer cells on a continuous basis can overtake the ability of your body to get rid of this cancer cells, um, then the problem may arise. But where did you get evidence for this? And we look at the literature, there are almost uh, no direct evidence, but when we look a little bit harder, we realize there are some really courageous experiments done in the 1950s. So this is a Dr. Chester Salmon, for most of them you probably don't know him, but if you read some of the older stories, you may realize that this is the experiment injecting human subjects with live cancer cells. It was a very profound but very clear message that he was trying to persuade the general public that there is a cancer resistance naturally present in our body, and especially in the healthy individual. However, this ability was lost in cancer patients. And because all the legal problems and ethical problem, problems and the entire line of study were shut down and all, almost disappeared after he ran into uh, these kind of problems. But however, the, the scientific message was very profound and a lot of people actually followed uh, his um, idea but not uh, but there's no way that you can do a similar experiment. So, in 1999, that we did not really design anything to look for cancer resistance. It was merely a laboratory accident that led us to this interesting phenomenon. That is, we, at the time, trying to generate ascites to collect antibody. So it was routine that you give the cancer cells into the peritoneum, you will generate ascites. These are very aggressive cancer. It will kill the host in three to four weeks. Okay. No 
single mouse ever survived. However, this mouse came along. We thought we forgot to inject this mouse. And after several attempts with increasing dose, and he still remained healthy. So that really surprised us. And then we uh, thought this must be a very dramatic event because if no any other mice survive and he survived, there must be something there, but it's only one mouse. So uh, it's very fortunate that this kind of a survivability against these cancer cells uh, can be passed on to the next generation and next generation. That was 10 years ago. We still have a very large colony in our uh, facility. It was 25 generations later, and it was several thousand miles uh, later that it passed on with a dominant <coughs> Mendelian trait. It appears to be that way. We also noticed that some people in the audience trying to sequence the, do the high throughput sequencing. Maybe this would be a great project for them <laughs> because it's genetic, it's inheritable, but we don't know what caused it. Perhaps these newer technologies can help us to answer this question uh, in a very definitive way. So this is the picture of this original mouse about a few weeks before he actually passed on uh, for natural reasons after a long life, after a very productive life. <laughs> they make me very jealous. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, you know, their life is measured by numbers, of our life is not. So. Uh, we also realized not uh, after, uh, before very long, that this reason for cancer resistance is because their immune cells are doing something to the cancer cell. If you look at the uh, wild type mice, basically all the laboratory mice we went through, that cancer cells just grow like crazy in the peritoneum. You put, put into them and wash them out after a few hours. However, if you look at these resistant mice, that they put these cancer cells in them, in a few hours they're in a lot of trouble. First, you see a lot of cells surrounding them, and second, you saw they are being ruptured. So we um, thought, oh, my goodness, I'm not an immunologist. <laughs> Look how much trouble it got me into because this seems to be a typical immunological reaction cases. And if you look at the EM, you can see this cell-cell interaction between the immune cells of the resistant host and the cancer cells is very tight. And uh, the, these immune cells latches onto the cancer cells in the process of killing them. There's the surface eruption of these uh, uh, surface uh, erosion of these uh, cells. And this physical contact is very important. If somehow, if you block this physical contact, let the diffusible molecule interact with each other, but not direct physical contact, you actually can block this killing event. Uh, that suggests uh, to us that cell-cell contact is very important. The cell has to get there and interact at the cell surfaces. This is uh, immune picture, uh, this is the electronic picture, uh, EM picture of cell surface erosion of these cancer cells. But also surprise us, there are two defector cells. If you're a cell biologist you, or a pathologist, you will immediately notice this is microphage, this is neutrophil. What are they doing there? It's a very interesting question because it's not supposed to be the cells that kill the cancer cells. It's about uh, cancer immunology is all about T cells, about B cells, how they've been educated to kill them. But what are these? What are these cells doing there? So this is a quick review of these two systems that we have, and also, also mouse system have. This is an innate immune system. It's very rapid, and very ferocious, and uh, uh, involved in the cells of the, like natural killer cells, microphage, neutrophil, and complement, and they can act within hours. The other is a more dedicated system, very uh, uh, low level, but very specific. Low level, I mean, compared to the innate uses, but usually it requires weeks, if not months. 
Here's a quick review of our immune system, uh, or white cell system in our uh, circulation. Uh, one type of cell called the granulocytes and neutrophils uh, are the majority of component of this. We may have probably 50 to 70 percent of our blood cells are belong to this uh, uh, class of neutrophil, and you have a other kind of a granulocytes. The lymphocytes in, is in this. It's it's about 5 to 10 percent of total white cells. And the, there are other cells, maybe 10 to 15 percent of them are something we call the monocytes. When they get into tissue, they're called the microphages. Then we realize in these mice that the things are made, this is a microphage, microphage, and this is a microphage, this is a lymphocyte. So these are staining with the NK cells. We thought it must be the NK cells at the, that time, but these microphage and neutrophil keep popping up. So we are quite surprised, and we don't know what to deal with. And the other thing is that you can see that we challenge them repeatedly for four times, and hoping that we could get some clue that what type of cells are interacting, uh, are involving in this cancer killing mechanism. So. After four challenges, it's still neutrophil and the microphage. These NK cells is not really NK cells because this is a marker assay because a lot of microphage express NK markers at that time. So basically, these are two major populations, microphage and neutrophil. So we know that it, this is an innate immune response and it's very rapid within a few hours. Uh, it can complete its task. So I'm, I still call myself a phenomenologist because I have to be visually convinced this is true that we actually can, uh, can see this kind of event. So uh, this is a, a cancer experiment injecting cancer cells into these mice and uh, take them out and put under the micro time lapse microscopy to see what really happened to them. And in this case, large cells are cancer cells, the ethnic sarcoma cells. You can see that these immune cells come in. By the end of this video, you would notice that all the cancer cells are captured by the immune cells. So they form very large cell aggregate that we know that there's something is happening. Okay. So it was quite convincing that eventually all of them get captured. So these rosettes, this is how the rosettes form, because you can even see the turbidity in the test tube changes if this happens. So the next event is uh, what happened after they captured them. So we caught this uh, uh, video here, is that you see this, how cells rupture. It's almost like a balloon pop, pop. So after I saw this, I was quite convinced that we we're dealing with something that we never saw it before. And, uh, but I was even happier when I saw this because we're talking about magic bullet. And here, I, this is my favorite video, video. I call it magic bullet. Look at this cell moving to this cancer cell here. Hit and pop. <laughs> so, uh, you, you have to believe that something is happening after you see this kind of video. So, but then there's a, a, a lot of public requests, if you will, from cancer patients and their family members say, like, why don't you move into the humans? So who cares about mouse cancer? You know, we want to kill as many of them as possible. But you know, the important thing is about human cancer. So I said, this perhaps is a transition that we can make to the human cancer. We devised this uh, cell killing assay simply to mix immune cells collect from these uh, individuals or uh, of my individual mice or humans and then mix with cancer cells after a certain time of incubation simply count how many cancer cells were alive after the incubation compared to the control uh, wells so that you don't add anything to it. So wild type mice have almost no cancer killing activity and resistant mice have some activity to kill even the uh, human cancer cells. It, it can even cause species to kill different cancer cells. 
And uh, when we look at the humans, and they are even higher uh, as a group. So it's, we, now we have a lot, I didn't uh, update this graph, but now we have a lot more points. But the basic message is still the same, is that uh, it uh, looks like a normal distribution. Some people high, some people low, most people in between. A belt uh, curve shape. Uh, for people who are a little bit older, it's the average is lower, the trend is going down. But if you look at the cancer patient, they're, they're even lower. So when we did this study, it's open label study. Okay. So then um, we did, um, uh, people challenged us, you know, why, why can't you do the double blinded? So we, we said, okay, so here's the double blinded. And here's healthy human. Uh, we have a little bit of saturation here because the ratio of cells are different there. But the point is very clear, is that the younger you are, the activity you are, you get a little bit older. It looks like some people can maintain that, most people can. And if you get to cancer patients, it's a lot lower. If you get to dogs. You know, human has, has about a, um, a, a, you know, 25 percent of mortality, overall mortality rate of, of cancer. Mice, about 80 percent, and dogs, about 50 percent. So it's right in between mice and human uh, dog population. So the next question is that where this activity is? So is in the agranulocytes or granulocytes? We realize that most activities are in the granulocytes. So that's a very surprise, a big surprise to us. But if you look at the count of these granulocytes in the individual, it can range from half of 50% to almost 70% of your white cells are granulocytes. If you calculate, calculate that and uh, compound them together, uh, you, most of this cancer killing activity is in the granulocyte fraction. And the question is that is that broad spectrum uh, or is a, uh, it's a specific to one type of cancer? We realize that cervical cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and the sarcoma, they all get killed into a relative high degree, quite similar to each other. Here's another serendipitous discovery, that is, we always run into the assay problem when winter comes, when Thanksgiving comes, when uh, Christmas comes. And then I just said, you know, to the graduate student who were doing this assay, I said, you must be distracted by all the holidays. So keep working on the system, change until it start work. So they, they go back to the lab and the, after several months, changing everything along the way and, and, and things start work again. But however, that we, after several years, it always happened at the same time. And then we realized it may be more than just making mistakes. So from 2005, we stopped changing things. We say, if we don't change anything, it's still going through this pattern, there might be something else. So we realized after we stopped that uh, the chain of messing around with all different component waters and assay solution, and it retained this pattern. We have too high, too low, we follow for uh, a long time. And then it appears to be very apparent, uh, very clear to, me, to us, is a seasonality. Our immune function goes a winter low, and we going back to this summer high. So it's quite a surprise to us, but it's very clear. So what's wrong with winter? A lot of people ask us, because our ancestors in the pre-technology era have has to conserve energies during the winter because you have no food availability uh, like we have right now. So the only way that our ancestors can survive winter is to reduce their metabolic weight. I sleep a lot more, eat a lot less, and do a lot fewer things than they would otherwise in the summer. And of course, we have a lot of things going wrong, and a lot of people mention vitamin D, but I think it's one of the uh, factors that needs to be considered, but it, it shouldn't be the only one. Uh, but if someone wants to uh, do this experiment, it's not that difficult to look into this uh, very interesting activity and it's changed during the season. So the question is that if the season has such a profound 
uh, uh, impact on our anti-cancer immunity, the, what about the area that don't have season change, like equatorial region? This is WHO data and it shows perhaps this is correct, is that all the low incident rate country for cancer mortality, uh, the incident, not mortality, the incident rate is near the equatorial region where there is no seasonal change. So uh, we're quite surprised to find this kind of a correlation. And, uh, um, but whether it's directly related, we don't know, but we hope someday we can figure them out. Also in humans, you can see that it's quite similar to the mouse, that when there is a killing activity, these cancer cells are surrounded by neutrophils and microphages, and these, in this case, too. If there's no killing of cancer cells, no activity, and these white cells simply leave them alone. So I have to see this in humans. So I also have these uh, students made another video to show whether they can be actually killed by these isolated, highly purified neutrophils or granulocytes. In this case, that you can see that this cell <coughs> get rocked. It's apoptosis, <laughs> and this one is apoptosis and the rupture. So this one it attached and get lifted up, and then go through. Uh, for it. Apoptosis. Okay. And in the end, I think we saw some uh, rupture of cells, so cytolysis, apoptosis also so occur at the same time. So it's whatever, the point is that whatever happens in human, in mice situation for killing cancer cells, it happened in human as well. Very similar mechanism. Uh, whether these activity are stable within the summer months, we um, come to this point. Every color represents one individual. Let me simplify this. And this one individual, very stable, and this low point that we later on find out it was after a day of extremely emotional stress, and we and it takes three days to recover, and we we know this is not an assay problem because we save half the blood, measure uh, three days later, compared to the fresh blood, it is because that day was very low after a very profound day of emotional stress. So the other anecdotal evidence we find out is that there's another low point for this individual. This is one of my graduate students. I sent him to the national, international meeting, and he has to make oral presentation for the first time in his life. He got really worked out for a few weeks, and uh, then uh, coming back, there's a point we missed because he just don't have enough granulocytes to do the assay. The cell count was so wiped out, and he was in a lot of trouble. Okay, so um, here's our uh, hypothesis. You know, this activity go up and down, and uh, in some individuals, if they go down, it will run into a lot of trouble. And this is our treatment proposal, and you can see that uh, you can select the donor according to their activity, and then use a machine called the apheresis machine to collect their granulocytes, and then give it to the cancer patient without touching anything uh, inside the bag and FDA approved this within 30 days. So it was a very, very uh, fast approval uh, to go to clinical trial. And this is published data say this similar strategy using unmanipulated uh, uh, white cells from these cancer resistant mice can cure a very uh, large tumor burden. And uh, we published this in 06, and it got a lot of the media attention, but uh, we also realized that there are something more important, and, uh, and so it turned out to be perfect. <laughs> and uh, there was another challenger from our uh, uh, institute and said, you know, these are not real cancer. You know, I have some real cancer. It's prostate cancer that if you knock out the P10 from the prostate, you can actually induce lethal prostate cancer. In that case, if you can cure this, I will believe you. So we treated with one injection of white cell from these resistant mice, and all of them are live longer. But when we look at the prostate, and these are normal prostate, and uh, these are p knockout prostate, 
and these are treated prostate. But if you're a pathologist or cell biologist, you would immediately notice that these are scar tissues. And these are, uh, so it's very effective. And, uh, but here's a quick uh, thought on the, before I close, it's a quick thought. What is the link between the spontaneous regression and the infection? There's a long history of suspicion these two may be linked. So Coley, William Coley is the first one to mention this, to, uh, to get a credit for it. Um, but we believe that the connection using nowadays knowledge is that you have granulocytes, monocytes, and lymphocytes. And the only connection is this. That we know with bacterial infection, the increase is granulocytes, 10, 20 times, maybe even 100 times. So that could be this. And there's uh, recently there a lot of people uh, have started to talk to me about possible uh, collaborations. And this is Senator uh, Tom Parkin, and this is a Congressman uh, uh, Berkeley Bidell. They have a lot of conversation going on. I, I really appreciate their support, their interest. And also, this is a longtime supporter, Dr. Roy O. This is my lab. And I think the biggest credit is supposed to go to the mouse. <laughs> Without them, we were not here today. Thank you.